plays a symphony on plastic frame. An opening without plastic leads to the campaign of plastic frame. In this new term, students design and make personalized book covers by making the most of used calendar sheets, brown bags, writing paper, and so on, offsetting over 5,000 plastic ones. Signing ceremony shows their determination for plastic free. Themed with Say No to White Pollution and Build a Lovely Homeland, the ceremony witnesses 1,158 teachers and students signing their names and make their promises. Theme class meeting delivers knowledge on plastic fray. In which teachers show students the harm of plastic bags, how to develop a habit of boycotting plastic, and key points of prohibiting plastic. Sharing bags highlights the meaning of plastic fray. Teachers and students paint these paper bags creatively and share them with parents friends, and other people in this city. All around the school, students plant flowers carefully, showing the theory of turning waste into treasure. Keeping in mind that we are embracing plastic fray, teachers and students use no plastic and therefore no white waste can be seen in school. With lush trees and frequent flowers, Qiyuan Primary School is humming a melody of harmony between nature and human. When we protect the oceans, we are protecting our future. A plastic ocean, we need a change. Tianjin Foreign Studies University Diplomacy Association wishes the conference a great success. The ocean is a cradle of life, a connecting nations around the world, and an important platform for globalization. We should make the ocean a bond for stronger solidarity and jointly build a maritime community with a shared future. The world is full of hope. Together, let's explore the sea we rely on. Wish mankind in the sea a better future. Protecting the land and sea environment, on which it depends, requires our joint efforts. May the sea always be clear and white, and men can be better. It's our duty to protect the oceans with life originally. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Bon dia. Welcome, Welcome to uh, this very, very, very special event, a side uh, event of the UN Ocean. We are sitting in the uh, major uh, display area of the government of Kenya, who is the co-president of, of this uh, tremendous Ocean UN Ocean Conference. Uh, our schedule is very tight today, so I'm going to pass the, the word on now to our key speaker, uh, Professor Michael James Traub, 
chairman of the International Engineering and Technology Institute and supernumerary of Wilson College, Oxford University. James, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fred. Can you hear me? Yeah, so it's my enormous pleasure to co-host this wonderful session on the ocean. Uh, and above me, you can see uh, one of the turtles that I dive with. I work with the IUCN on coral reefs, and it's my great pleasure to co-host this session. We've got an amazing, inspiring lift of speakers, and uh, I'm going to sum up at the very end. So without further ado, I'll hand back to the wonderful Fred to be. Uh, thank you, James. And we're looking forward to hearing you later on uh, with a statement from this meeting. Uh, I'd now like to call upon uh, Jose Agosto Duarte, uh, the ambassador of Portugal to China. Ambassador Duarte. Dear chairs and organizers, distinguished members of the panel, dear friends, I am happy to take part in this side event organized okay. at the market of the timely and highly important United Nations Ocean okay. Conference, UNOC 2022, close in Paris by Portugal and Kenya, here in Lisbon, by the sea. The over uh, far reaching uh, theme of this major event will be, and I quote, scaling up the ocean action based on science and innovation for the implementation of Goal 14 which is stock-taking partnerships and solutions. As the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, warned years ago, and I quote him, our oceans are in serious trouble from coral bleaching to biodiversity loss. Healthy oceans save lives and save life work. We need urgent climate action to protect our oceans and our future. And that's because oceans matter that they underpin Poverty, eradication, and food security are a source of employment and life woods and support the well-being of humans all over the planet. Marine and coastal ecosystems provide protection from natural disasters and oceans supply oxygen for life on Earth while contributing to regulate global climate. In order to fully benefit from the ocean's huge potential, we need to protect it in the first place. And so, an accurate assessment of the issues impacting the sea, bridge builders for political partnerships, and bright minds pulling together for science-based solutions are what we need to achieve that goal. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Portugal is a coastline country with its entire history dev devoted to the sea. So it will be its future. For the Portuguese people, the sea has always been a bridge of connection with other peoples, never a barrier. Always a pass, never a division. Nowadays, it's even more necessary to look at the ocean with this sense of inclusiveness and care. Nowadays, the fulfillment of the Sustainable Development Goals is closely interconnected with the ocean. The ocean covers 71% of the surface of our planet. The ocean generates more than half of the oxygen that we breathe all over the planet. The ocean holds 97% of the world water and the ocean supplies food and pharmaceuticals necessary for you, all humankind. The ocean finally provides millions of jobs for the entire planet. In fact, the ocean-based economy is estimated to be between 125 and 145 trillion US dollars a year, according to studies available all over the world. A decline in ocean health is a major threat for the world today due to the increase in pollution, warming and sea level rise, water acidification, and over-exploitation of marine resources. The nature of the 2030 Agenda and its three dimensions, which is environmental, economic, and social, demands careful balance between protection, conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of marine biodiversity. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, joint efforts and a multilateral approach are therefore more than needed. Altogether, we are still not too many given the dimension of the challenge. And degradation of marine ecosystems is indeed one of the most pressing issues we are facing today. There is only one planet B, one planet and no planet B. It's urgent to gather a consensus 
and forge ahead, namely towards achieving carbon neutrality that benefits all nations and all peoples around the world. Investing in new and green technologies is key. Phasing out old and polluting ones and thereby reaping the social and economic benefits that will undoubtedly arise from a green transition. No one, I underline, no one can do it alone. And all will be armed by the misdeeds of even one or just a few nations. The impact of the damage, despite the source, will be global always and will affect all of us, affect each and every one of us. So we'll have to be our joint action for this common purpose. Multilateralism is absolutely indispensable here and everyone shall put forth its finest controversies. I am persuaded that a strong Chinese engagement in the United Nations Ocean Conference, particularly in the discussion involving the promotion of the SDG 14, is of paramount importance for the final outcome, not just of the conference itself, but most important for power, for the power and example that we give to many other nations and an example of engagement and responsibility for the common good of all of us. Thank you very much and I wish great success to the event. Muito obrigado, Sr. Ambassador Duarte. Uh, I think you have given us a wonderful idea to start this conference. And it, it is in how, in order to really take full advantage of the great potential of the ocean. And I think you've opened a secret door for us. We must respect the ocean and we must respect the ocean together. Now I would like to pass the uh, word on to Palitha Kohona, Ambassador of Sri Lanka to China. Ambassador uh, Kohona, it's your, the floor is yours. Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends. It is with pleasure that I take this opportunity to address you today. It brings back many memories. As you may be aware, I was the co-chair of the United Nations Ad Hoc Working Group on Biological Diversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, BBNJ for short. We're also meeting at a time when the world is nervously staring into the frightful uncertainty of a major economic crisis. Economies have shrunk, growth has slowed, unemployment is rising, supply chains have been disrupted, and the dreaded specter of inflation is looming. This is a crisis that is threatening to overwhelm many of us. It is not only the poor who are most threatened, relatively wealthy countries are also affected. 69 to 70 countries are seriously affected at this point, and 37 may require bailouts. The situation has been brought to this crisis point mainly by the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has certainly taken its toll, not only in terms of human life, but also on the economies of countries. We are approaching the United Nations Ocean Conference on the conservation and sustainable development of marine diversity against this very difficult and challenging background. The ocean represents 71% of the globe. Over 3 billion people depend on the ocean directly or indirectly for their livelihood. And there is more biological diversity in a bucket of seawater than in hectares and hectares of dry land. Life began in the ocean and the ocean continues to support life. We depend on the ocean for more things than we can imagine, not only by being the biggest sink for carbon dioxide, but also the ocean provides the protein intake for more than 50% of the world's population. In the circumstances, it is our sacred duty to ensure that the oceans and marine biological diversity are protected and conserved. The oceans are linked to all the SDGs in one way or the other. 
Today, we need to assign more areas to be protected in the ocean because they also constitute the spawning grounds for endless varieties of marine life. The target is to bring 30% of the high seas within maritime protected areas. Large marine protected areas already exist around Hawaii, Cook Islands and Antarctica. A Sri Lankan initiated resolution on seagrass was overwhelmingly endorsed by the UN General Assembly. These are the areas that will help the oceans to rejuvenate. The ocean-based biodiversity already provides raw material for a large number of drugs. Increasingly, more and more patients are patents, uh, bigger pardon, increasingly more and more patents are based on ocean life forms. There are other drugs that are likely to be discovered as science learns more and understands the oceans better. As the global economic crisis intensifies, many financial mechanisms are being looked at, in particular to assist poorer countries. I would like to suggest that some of these financial resources be allocated for ocean-related SDG activities of developing countries. They could be used for improved and sustainable fishing, thus contributing to better employment generation, better training, advancing education and training, sustainable aquaculture, better storage and marketing, helping to improve income and reducing poverty. At least the recovery from the economic crisis, which we will, from which we will recover sooner than later, could be utilized to assist the ocean and those who depend on the ocean. We need to turn this crisis to an opportunity that will serve humanity well in the future. I also recall the suggestion that the wealth that will be generated by exploiting the ocean's biodiversity could be shared equitably with the developing world. To borrow from a Chinese saying, if you give a man a fish, he will live for a day. But if you teach him to fish, you give him a life. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. As you know, we all respect the jewel that your country is, a jewel of serendipity set in, the, in a beautiful ocean. And thank you for the very practical suggestions that you have posed to us today. Now, I would like to turn the floor over to a great friend of, of nature, a great friend of the Club of Rome, of all of us, uh, Eric Solheim. Eric, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much and ni hao to all my Chinese friends. Uh, it's great uh, to be with you. I believe that China's relationship to the ocean is very interesting historically because on one hand, China is not an ocean-oriented nation like Sri Lanka, which we just heard from, or Portugal, or my nation, Norway. China has mainly been an inward-looking nation focused on the great rivers, the Yangtze uh, and the Yellow River, Pearl River. Uh, but at the same time, China also fostered the greatest uh, uh, voyager of oceans of all time, Shenghe, which interestingly enough came from the inland and landlocked province of Yunnan, and made voyages on the global oceans, much bigger than in a Portugal, Portuguese or Spanish, or for that matter, uh, Norwegian explorer. So it's a paradoxical, interesting relationship, but we now see China coming forward, doing a lot more uh, to protect the oceans and becoming a lead nation in the common global effort to protect this one big ocean which we have in common. The great Chinese sage uh, Confucius once said that uh, the wise man should be modest in talk, uh, but strong in action. And that's exactly what we need to do in our time because we are talking quite a lot. Uh, we are not so strong in action. Let me suggest four areas for action, for global action uh, for the ocean. First, 
we need to stop climate change because that's a main threat to life in the ocean. The main threat to the coral reefs is simply the warming of the ocean. One degree warming of the ocean is a massive threat to say the Great Barrier Reef in, uh, Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So this must stop and ocean related action can help. We need to move into green shipping because shipping is a important uh, global uh, uh, source of climate emissions. Green hydrogen is a pot enormously potential and promising green fuel for the future. We can have green ship electric shipping and there is already electric ships on the Yangtze River. And in the future, we can have electric ships on the big oceans and they can be or even um, uh, powered by offshore wind in the ocean. So let's move fast into this enormous opportunities for green shipping. And of course, China is absolutely core here. Seven out of the 10 biggest ports in the world are hosted in China and all 10 are hosted in East Asia. And for green shipping, you need the green equipment um, uh, on, on the land to make this happen. But in the next decade or two, 20, 30% of global um, power may come from green hydrogen and ships may be powered that way. Secondly, let's stop illegal fishing. Outside the coast of Africa, you see European and Chinese vessels simply plundering these very poor countries. They don't have the Coast Guard to stop it. You can even see it from the capitals of African cities. And this is simply stealing the resources of poor nations and destroying the fish stocks at the same time. It's a theft, it's a crime, and it needs to stop. And we should globally take action to make sure it stops. Thirdly, we need the right balance between protection of oceans, as Paulita Kohona spoke about, which is important, and a sustainable use. I think in this regard, my nation Norway has been quite um, in the front line. We have some management plans for the oceans, which include everything, the protection of the ocean, the fishing, the oil and gas, the uh, leisure time uh, activities of the people, Everything is included in these management plans and they work quite well. And we have with our partners in the European Union, Russia and Iceland, been able to establish a system in the North Sea where the main breeding grounds of the fish are, are sufficiently protected to make fish abundant for the fishermen. Both uh, herring and cod were close to disappearance now they're back in abundance of very, very rich fisheries, but that's because we have found the right balance between protection uh, and sustainable use. And I think this is exactly what China is now doing in the Yangtze and the Yellow River, where it's a 10 year fishing ban, which is a heavy price to be paid in the short run, but an enormous gain uh, in the long run. And fourthly, we need to take global joint action for the ocean outside national boundaries. We cannot embark upon a huge uh, spree of uh, uh, offshore mining, sea, sea, seabed mining, without any regulations and rule for this to happen. As long as there is no rules, uh, we need to move very, very slow. And there is the need for a global agreement uh, on the protection of the oceans beyond national boundaries. So I suggest that we move from talk to action. And in these four areas, green shipping, uh, stop illegal fishing, make uh, pro protection and sustainable use uh, the right mixture, and let's protect the oceans beyond uh, the national boundaries. If we do this, uh, we will pay tribute to Confucius and show that we are not men, we are not small men, which are just talking a lot, but we are wise men, uh, which are uh, strong on action. Thank you so much. Obrigado. Xie xie. Thank Eric. Wonderful. I think you have left us with three very, very special words. Strong in action, strong on action. And that is something where we have to excel. Now I would like to pass uh, the baton on to Pei Su. Uh, the founder of Act Asia. Pesu, please. 
Can you all see me? Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, dear ambassadors, Dr. Joe, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it is a greatest honor for Act Asia to co-host today's SAI event together with China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation. Act Asia's work to drive long-term sustainable change for animal people and the environment through a range of education programs for children, consumers, and professionals, particularly in China. Our award-winning program, Caring for Life Education, recognized by the United Nations, drive positive, sustainable, long-term change in Asian society, helping people to understand and appreciate the importance of independence of animals, people, and the environment. Agdasia's work follows the sustainable development goals. And I think we all know climate, climate change is made, driving major change and loss in ocean diversity with significant impacts on planetary health. As well as other anthropogenic factors, climate change is making ocean more vulnerable by increasing ocean temperature and acidity and decreasing oxygen, causing the erosion of ocean biodiversity. Overfishing and overspending seafood has been one of the most significant aspects which lead the damage to marine biodiversity. In addition to that, around 33% of global fishery are overfished. Around 40% of all fish are caught unintentionally. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, people eat significantly more fish than they used to. In fact, we're eating twice as many fish as they were 50 years ago. We humans demand 100 million tons of fish products from the ocean every year. The world's growing demand for marine fishery products and other seafood is increasing. The, this demand will be at the level to cause catastrophic damage to the ecological balance of marine life. There are currently about 540 million people in the world who benefit directly from fish production. And a disaster in the marine ecosystem would have terrible impact on economy and livelihood of this group of people. In order to conserve marine biodiversity, we must tackle overfishing and irresponsible consumption. This is why Ag Asia's consumer education call for all consumers to join compassion lifestyle and consume responsibly. If we have learned anything from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is that we cannot just take nature for granted. The damage we have caused to the nature has eventually come back to us. If we continue to overfish, many of, of the world's fish population may be gone within 25 years. The death or deformation of marine life alters the ecological balance of the entire ocean. And the reduction in biodiversity will not only threaten the human food source, but more seriously lead to more outbreak of multiple epidemics. Next week, the 2022 United Nations High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development will be started in New York. The theme for the 2022 LPF is building back uh, building back better from a coronavirus disease. This year, five sustainable development goals will be reviewed in this forum, including sustainable development goal for education, 14, life be below water, 15, life on land, and 17, um, partnership for the goal. Goal 14 is to conserve and sustainable use the ocean, seas, and marine resources with 10 target and 10 indicators. We all need to work together to meet this target and indicator. Furthermore, the synergy between different sustainable goals should be recognized and turned into a strategic plan as protecting ocean, marine life, and life on land are all interconnected. The pollution in the ocean and loss of marine life will impact life on land. I'm sure today's speakers will give us more explicit example of the point about sustainable development goals goal 17 is partnership 
The United Nations explained the successful sustainable development agenda requires partnership between governments, the private sector, and civil society. This inclusive partnership built upon principles and value as a shared vision and shared goals that place people and the planet at the center are needed at the global, regional, national, and local level, levels. In light of this, today's um, event has demonstrated an excellent example of partnership. Different stakeholders being here to share our suggestion and work is a new beginning of the partnership among us for the marine biodiversity conservation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pei Su. Uh, you brought up the word education, and that is so vital that for all of us to focus on improving education, improving understanding, improving care, improving respect. So thank you very much. Uh, I would now like to call upon Zhou Jinfeng, the mastermind behind today's meeting, and uh, Zhou Jinfeng, the chairman of C uh, deputy chairman of CBC GDF, the, sec the secretary general. Uh, please, we're looking forward to your words. Co chairs, Professor James Crabb and Professor Fred Duby, distinguished invited speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Linda from China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation, or the CBCGDF. Thank you so much for your participating in this site event, Marine Biodiversity Conservation and Sustainable Development, promoting synergies between uh, SDG for seven, uh, 13, 14, and 15 on this important tw uh, 2022 UN Ocean, um, UN Ocean Conference today. On behalf of the CBCGDF and uh, ACT Asia, we would like to express our heartfelt welcome and uh, appreciation to all of your kind support. Uh, the China Biodiversity Conservation and Green Development Foundation uh, is uh, the leading and only national academic society for biodiversity conservation and green development in China. Uh, marine biodiversity conservation and green development has been a long uh, focus of our work. Uh, during uh, the, the over the past uh, thir 37 years, our efforts include but not limited to like uh, this marine biodiversity conservation and uh, sustainable development. We have established coastal community conservation areas to mobilize people and the communities to join marine conservation. Uh, since 2016, we have established more than 180 such protected areas uh, around China and more among them more than 12 are coastal community conservation areas covering species like uh, corals, spotted seals, uh, water birds, and uh, as well as intertidal wetlands. And uh, we also uh, address land-based pollution via human-based solutions. Uh, we have carried out a lot of uh, events to aware people's uh, understanding about plastic pollution, like the picture you see on the right. Uh, we worked with our partner to, um, to mobilize people saying no to plastic challenge. Uh, every day they uh, they try to make a difference, and uh, altogether, more than 700,000 people participated in this uh, movement. And in the picture, in the center picture, uh, it was taken yesterday on my biodiversity survey, the birds using plastics for nests. So you can see the discarded material from our uh, overconsumption has made a huge uh, negative impact to our environment. And we believe 
the fundamental solution is human-based solutions or the HBS. Uh, that's why we work so hard in mobilizing um, people and uh, especially to aware young people's awareness. We uh, carried out a lot of events and uh, uh, and uh, activities for children to participate and to able to do something. Uh, I hope in this uh, event <laughs> you you will uh, hear more from our voices. And so thank you again for uh, our delegates for your hard working and uh, we are looking forward to a very successful site event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. It's, it's wonderful that you are able to bring us Zhou Jinfang's words. And I know also how deeply you believe in them and how deeply you work for them. Uh, now I would like to pass the t the the microphone to uh, Sarah. Sarah, I, I, can I still call Sarah Plato? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's all yours, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Sara Plato from Zhanghai University, Wuhan, where uh, I conduct research on animal behavior and welfare. I will try to share this screen. Let's see if I can do that. Share. Uh, can you see? Uh, everybody, can you see? Yes, I can see. Yes, Okay. we can see. Okay, so um, one of the definitions of uh, uh, sustainable development was uh, given by the Prime Minister of Norway in 1987, uh, Mr. Brandland, who uh, defined sustainable development as the development that meets, uh, um, that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of a future generation to meet their needs. Unfortunately, until now, we have not been able to actually keep up with this goal. And if we don't change our way of life, we are risking to miss this goal. In order to achieve this objective, we have to uh, like, uh, uh, balance the four demands issue, which is food supply, conservation, animal welfare, and sustainability. All these four demands are pressuring like, in order to develop. In, uh, in particular, for example, if you consider the uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, uh, framework, uh, uh, actually that this incorporates uh, the importance of the sustainable, sustainability, sustainable development, and on the other side, human well-being. But uh, with the exception of the uh, SDG 14, the life below water, and SDG 15, the life on land, the majority of the SDG uh, lack two key aspects. In fact, they uh, waive both animal welfare and conservation into the development of each goal. And uh, like human development and economic growth is strongly linked tied with our animals, and the, and, the ecosystem, and the ecosystem we share with them. Therefore, if you want to achieve a, a world of peaceful species uh, coexistence, we must uh, uh, balance the agenda of conservation, food supply, animal welfare, and sustainability. For example, if uh, we, since we are at the UN Ocean Conference, so if we consider aquaculture is one of the human activity that uh, actually still require a, a great effort and work in order to achieve the balance of these four demands. In particular, aquaculture was initially developed in order to like uh, reduce the pressure of the fishery on the wild fish stock, and in the same time to support for supply. And even though aquaculture actually has achieved the later point, food supply, the truth is it does not relieve the pressure on the wild stock because according to FAO, till now, uh, fishery uh, like uh, poach 94 million metric tons of fish every year. 
And uh, beside aquaculture by itself, uh, breed 174 million metric tons of fish and seafood every year and growing each year. And it comprises 408 animal species. Actually, it's like uh, uh, exponentially uh, higher than the livestock on land. And because of this, uh, aquaculture has to keep these animals alive, not only with food, but also to keep them free from pathogens. And therefore, every year they use between 10,000 and 30,000 tons of antibiotics, uh, of which between 70 and 90 percent goes into the environment. So you can understand that the impact that aquaculture has on the surrounding ecosystem is immense. And uh, of course, uh, in order to like solve this problem, uh, aquaculture, the, the industry so, should address uh, important risk. And, and to solve this, for example, uh, it should uh, like, uh, instead to favor uh, like uh, carnivore species like salmon and cephalopod that uh, actually have uh, a huge impact on uh, environment, conservation and welfare. They should favor, for example, seaweed or like, uh, uh, herbivore species that have less impact on, on the environment. So in order to do that, we should push research, policy, incentivization to like develop in aquaculture or the system that actually are more sustainable. And uh, aquaculture is not all bad because, for example, there are like among, you know, the different activities, some of them actually are also important in uh, like supporting restocking of rudimental species. But as we can see from this slide, uh, uh, unfortunately, until now, not only aquaculture, but in general, the like uh, activity of human activity, they are pushing only from one side, which is the food supply. And it's like the more stronger in this moment, it does not allow the other three demands to develop, you know, a, in a balance. Therefore, especially people from developed country, uh, in order to balance food supply, each of us, each human being, but in particular the one in the developed country that had for longer time a consumer privilege, we should give up part of this, you know, of this privilege and allow therefore a balance of these four demands. Thank you. I don't Thank know. you very much, Sarah. That was absolutely wonderful. And now, uh, okay. Yes. Okay. All Thank right. You. Good. Now, now I would like to introduce my colleague from uh, the beautiful BGI campus in Qingdao, uh, Fan Guangyi. Uh, and as you know, uh, Qingdao is also the capital, the marine capital of China. So, Fan Guangyi, the uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for it. Hello, uh, everybody. I'm Guang Yifan from BGI. I'm a genomic uh, research, and the title of my presentation today is uh, Sequence Life for the Future of Life. So, I'm going to talk about BGI's work on marine diversity from uh, genetic uh, genomic respect. Uh, so I will first to introduce the BGI group. The future of BGI group is the uh, integration of industry, education, and research. So there are uh, several non-profit organizations uh, in BGI, uh, included uh, BGI Research, uh, Giga Science, uh, and the uh, faculty, uh, China National Gene Bank, and the uh, uh, Hospital. So we also have several industry organizations, uh, such as the uh, BGI, uh, mainly focus on the future, the field of the genome research. And uh, uh, the second one is MGI, uh, which is one of the only two companies in the world that can be produced sequence and not on uh, not scale. So they are also uh, uh, BGI universal and uh, high scale. So uh, digital life uh, access to global biodiversity, uh, 
biology genetic information which can deepen our understanding of life and biodiversity. So this, uh, the Earth Biogenome Project, uh, a large scale project was launched in 2017. So this project and aims to sequence about 1.5 million known um, occurred uh, within 10 years. So in the ocean part, our end is that all the ocean life species will be sequenced and stored and be stored in uh, digital information. The final complete completion of several digital life projects will uh, greatly accelerate the progress of the life science and biodiversity study. So the first project is fish, uh, fish tank K genome project leading by BJ Research. We aim to complete 10,000 fish genome in three state with 10 years. So in the first state we snaked and the sequence, sequenced the representation fish species in the order level, we sequenced and obtained a total of uh, 748 fish genome data, which cover more than 19 of the fish orders. So in the uh, marine microbiome, uh, we integrate the uh, metagenome data sequenced by PGI and the race on the NCBI. So and when and then we reconstruct the most complete metagenome database of marine microbiome so far. So it was a total of more than uh, 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 13,000 samples. So uh, we finally we found uh, more than 69% uh, bacterial genomes and about 74% of key genomes were unclassified species. So, and uh, they, uh, we we uh, initiated a global uh, ocean microbiome project and the uh, MIA project. It doesn't work like that. Sorry. So they uh, they publish algin uh, project uh, algin genomic is our is our total of uh, three hundred and forty. Four species, most of which are, are green algae. Uh, based on the algae genomic data we established and the algae phylogenetic tree, which show the green and the red algae can uh, clearly be di divided into distinct groups. So this database is marine uh, invertebrate, invertebrate genome data. We collect about uh, 383 marine invertebrate uh, genomes. Mollusks are the second group in the uh, animal uh, kingdom. So uh, we initiate uh, M10K project to, estab to establish a large scale uh, high uh, quality genome database uh, to provide our genome database uh, for important sequence uh, scientific questions and about diversity convo conversation. So this study sequence and uh, assembly the whole genome of 70 uh, marine mammal species at the family levels. We reconstruct the most comprehensive marine mammals phylogenetic tree based on whole genome data and online uh, analyzed the molecular adaptation mechanism of marine mammals from land to sea. So uh, this study, uh, we uh, released more than uh, 14 high quality mangrove, uh, mangrove plant genomes. So we also reconstructed the phylogenetic tree relationship and explored the origin, evolution, and the response of mangrove plants on global change. So uh, in brief sum summary, we have constructed several marine life genomic state database. They are the uh, molecular uh, basis for biodiversity conversation. This is uh, the tree of life uh, map 
They all have several large genome projects for different groups, such as VGP, P10K, Fish10K, and 10 kp So thanks very much for your attention. Welcome to uh, Bizar Qingdao. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fan Guangyi. That was excellent. And I think what we're learning from these discussions is that our decisions, our strategies, must be driven by science. And it's too easy to make some nice assumptions and pursue them wildly, or to forget about the science and just go ahead blindly. So this, this is very, very critical for us in all that we do is to be science respecting and science driven. Now, I'm very happy to, to present the floor to El Khalid Sharif, who has joined us here in the uh, delegation, the CBC GDF delegation in uh, Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, and he is another scientist and Khalid, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank CGDF for the invitation and also for Sana uh, Kasavna, which make me, made me in contact with them. And I'm very happy today to uh, talk, uh, to say a word uh, of ISR, Institute of uh, System uh, for System and Robotics. And before in Lisbon, and before I will, I, I start talking about my experience, how our experience uh, in the ocean system, in the, in the point of view of science, and the science, I would like to say that the ocean is the ocean before that, we working just on the technical study, I mean, using softwares, I mean, some informative stuff. So, environments, so, the Okay. So, uh, so, so it was my first year of PhD and where I, uh, the field of coastal water, deep sea and uh, uh, remote sensing. I had many difficulties uh, to understand in the beginning, the concept, the methodology and the dynamic. Till I decided the moment that I start for field study, for sampling. So I was thinking I'm not the correct person for this kind of study based for the ocean, but everything will, will change later. You cannot imagine my feeling touching the water, coastal water, it was amazing. I feel connected. And I said, this is what I want to do. So I'm sure everyone in love with the sea, with the coast. And at least this is in there one per year. But this ecosystem today is suffering. And the traditional methodology to access this special ocean pollution requires a lot of human being, a lot of money and a lot of time. So that's where I entered in, in my first study in ocean, developing a new monitoring tool for coastal water based on the remote sensing technology or data. Studying these amazing ecosystems and the environment made me enjoy all the step of experiment from field sampling Institute science analysis to the laboratory work, physical, chemical analysis, bacteriological, to the interpretation of results, to the remote sensing analysis using sat satellite images from Landsat, Sentinels, to the GIS work in order to show the results. This work was subject of many publications with different teams in the North Africa, the South of Spain, and also in Gulf of Trieste, which opened the door to me to work with many teams in Europe, for Portugal, Spain, Italy, Slovenia, and finally coming back to this world within ISR, Institute for System and Robotics. We at ISR, we believe that using new technologies such as robot sensing and robotic 
is a good scientific touch for managing biodiversity. Currently, we are working uh, on many projects in collaboration with different institutes and NGOs to support the ocean observation and the monitoring the pollution situation in Europe or any prior Atlantic, for example, hydrocarbons, plastic, microplastic. So this is for the sea surface parameters. As ours also is supporting these subjects, also the underwater through many projects, through two projects using developed robots and techniques. So finally, I would like to say that promoting synergy between SDGs 4, 7, 13, 14, and 15 is a good thing to preserve our money in biodiversity. Promoting a good quality of education is an ambitious moment. In youth, which provide qualified youth and good political point of view for a great green energy strategy that implements equilibrium system thinking for sustainable development and limit the effect of climate change that's impacting our life today. Indeed, we can have a sustainable life in land and underwater with the A14 and 15. I would like to mention in the end that the synergy between all of these goals cannot be just with the S just with, with the SDG 17, which partnership for the goals. All the all those goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Khalil. That was really wonderful. And all I can say is may peace be unto you. Uh, now, now I would like to pass the uh, the microphone to Helen Quayle, the Senior Policy uh, Officer of Marine and Climate for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. Thank you very, very much. Please go ahead. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about powering healthy seas and accelerating nature positive offshore wind. So to limit global temperature increases, we know that we have to accelerate the shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy. In what needs to be a swift and ambitious route to decarbonize, we must not forget that this is a dual emergency of nature loss and climate change. I'm going to focus on offshore wind, which can impact wildlife and habitats above and below the waves, and that can be during construction, operation and decommissioning. The scale of offshore wind needed across our ocean means that construction and operation will be ongoing for decades. An unprecedented level of human activity and infrastructure development on such a scale that we risk the complete industrialization of the marine environment. Offshore wind, though, is a proven low cost renewable technology that is vital for our energy transition, energy security and to tackle the cost of living crisis. Rather than offshore wind or nature, we need to find the pathway that they can walk or this being an ocean conference swim together. We know that this makes sense, that healthy seas are our ally in the climate emergency. We need a joint response rather than isolated approach, approaches that perpetuate action in silos when nature often loses. The RSPB proposes that we accelerate nature protection and restoration with equal ambition to and hand in hand with our offshore energy transition. So I'm going to take those two elements in turn, nature protection first. Nature is often perceived as a barrier to the acceleration of offshore wind. However, the real challenges are rooted in planning systems developed when this was an emerging technology. In many instances, these challenges hinder other elements as well, including grid connections, market readiness and supply chains. Our recommendations to streamline consenting and accelerate deployment while taking account of nature include a robust and strategic evidence base that provides certainty for developers and informs the siting of new offshore wind farms. Where marine spatial planning is incomplete or outdated, ahead of a full reform, country level marine plans specifically for offshore renewables can be established to better coordinate expansion and assess ecological impacts at the outset. Cumulative impact assessment to fully understand the complete impacts of offshore wind developments beyond the individual project level is also needed, along with industry standards for mitigation that prevent harm and drive innovation. Robust adaptive management to enable the development to proceed with safeguards in place and monitor new mitigation measures and adapt them as needed. 
We also need a clear understanding and application of strategic compensation that addresses the ecological needs of impacted species, habitats, and protect site integrity. And robust networks or frameworks for marine net gain to enable developer action to enhance nature. Second, nature positive in our energy transition and how we can use this to restore our ocean. The Nature Positive Movement is a global ambition to drive action and investment in nature across all sectors with the a goal of a world richer in biodiversity with thriving economies. Our working definition for Nature Positive Offshore Wind is sector and government led actions that go above and beyond avoiding and halting nature loss to tackle the root causes of decline in order to restore resilient thriving seas. The scale of offshore wind in our busy scenes, seas means that it's already interacting and competing for space with other sectors and human activities. Decisions about which pressures and activities cease, continue or expand will be necessary as we undertake a just transition. Government intervention is required to implement and enable nature positive actions that reduce and remove key pressures. An ecosystem-based approach is fundamental to success. We need measures that recover populations, address the modifications of habitats and disruption of food webs. We must also tackle invasive species, protect blue carbon, and ensure that marine protected areas are sufficient and effectively protected. We need blue parks, not paper parks. Using seabirds as an example to look at the nature positive approach, what we need things like measures to enhance forage fish populations, for example, by closing industrial sand eel fisheries to ensure that nature has enough food. We need effective and ambitious implementation of comprehensive monitoring and mitigation measures in fisheries to minimize and eliminate bycatch. The completion and effective management of marine protected area networks to safeguard the most important areas, and that needs to include sites for foraging and sites for prey species. We need seabird island security programs that maintain preventative early detection and rapid incursion response measures on seabird islands to keep them free of mammalian predators. And we need government led strategic, holistic and truly spatial marine planning that provides clarity for marine users across the breadth of our seas and ensures collective pressures of human activities are truly sustainable. We must change today to power tomorrow. We must act on these challenges by harnessing the ambition of nature positive as a catalyst for ocean recovery and truly transformative energy transition. We must do this in collaboration at scale internationally for the benefit of nature, people and climate. And we must do so now. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you very much, Helen. That was wonderful. Uh, last week, I spent the days in Nairobi at the CBD meeting. And one of the things that became very clear is that nature positive by 2030 is not a dream, but it's something that will require a tremendous amount of effort and dedication to achieve. And my feeling was the delegates, the, the, the NGOs from around the world that were in Nairobi all agree that it's possible to do it if we do work together. So thank you very, very much. Now I'd like to pass the, the, the microphone on to Juan Bao uh, of IGM Human Practices. Juan, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm Yuhan from IGM Foundation. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share some experiences from IGM on science education. And IGM is a nonprofit organization registered in the United States, United States, uh, dedicated to the advancement of clean technology, education, and competition. It seems this is not directly related to the marine, but I think the linkage between IGM and also the marine protection is within our empowerment for youth to do some experience, uh, to do a, make a difference by clean technology since 2003. The major program of IGM Foundation is our annual competition. Each year, thousands of young thinkers biologists participate in IGM, and they compete for medals and special awards. This is a journey of more than 10 months to solve a problem by using thinkers biology by themselves. And within uh, the 19 years development, now we have involved more than 46 countries. And last year, we have 
350 teams with more than 7,000 participants to participate in the iGEM competition. And I think iGEM is special because we are not only focused on the science education, but the most importantly, we emphasize the importance of values and the responsibility. Especially within human practices program, we ask the teams to consider whether their project is responsible and good to the world. And they need to be reflexive and responsible and responsive to meet the needs of the society while also get engagement with the public. And iGEMers are encouraged to solve the grand challenges. Each project has just to solve the problem using things biology, and we reward many kinds of the work. We have 13 project tracks, and among them, the environment track, manufacturing track, and food track are all related to the uh, environment protection, especially the marine protection, to prevent the harm to the environment while also reduce the pollution. We are also rewarded special prizes to the excellences. One of them is our best sustainable development impact prize to encourage youth to participate in the global conversations to help develop solutions towards meeting the SDGs. Each year, many IGM teams from all over the world are working together by using, using the tools of think biology to solve the problems and grand challenges on marine protection. They are focused covering agile blooms, coral bleaching, plastic pollution, biodiversity loss, and other threats to the world's oceans. Here are two examples. Jiangnan China is an undergraduate student's teams last year. Their project is aimed to save the coral reefs, and they focused on the coral bleaching caused by the chemical cosmetics. And they are trying to produce equally friendly bio sun cream by using think, uh, yeast based on think biology. A second example is of Great Bay United. This is a high school student's team. They were shocked by the loss of horses' show crabs due to the human needs for the blood to produce luminous army bicycle loss to, to detect endotoxins. So they aim to use the power of think biology to create a practical artificial luminous, which can hopefully replace the natural luminous by using protein characterization of engineered strength of think biology. So by doing, using think biology creatively, iGEMAs tackle the problems of marine protection from the source to the end. iGEM is also influence, extend its influence to the larger group by open science education and empowerment for youth. iGEM projects are open. Teams created a standardized biological paths and share them in open industry. They document their projects through a public wiki and through video presentations. And they are also encouraged to learn from the peers in the iGEM community. They need to collaborate with at least one another iGEM team on a set of shared objectives to meet the gold or civil medal criteria. iGEM teams are also encouraged to develop new opportunities to include more people in shaping think technologies, such as innovative educational tools and outreach activities to establish two-way dialogue with new communities by discussing public values and the science behind think technology. What's more, we are also trying to reach the local community in developing countries. Each region has its own specific challenges. The iGEM leagues are local, uh, local and regional competitions designed to enable local people to learn and apply think biology to solve the local problems. So iGEM teams are encouraged to do more things rather than only do science within iGEM competition. And here is an example of Great Bay United last year they collaborated with another Chinese team to hold a lecture for high school students. During this lecture, they do not only share the Think Biology program, but they also share some information why they choose this program. They will be talk about biodiversity and also marine protection. Also, during this project, they also communicated with other stakeholders, such as the, the non-NGOs non on marine protection. So I think all in all, by doing this, IGM extends the science education to larger group by the IGM's ambassadors. So finally, is some personal thoughts on the marine education and how to integrate all of the uh, different SDG goals. I think we need to emphasize the synergy effect between the traditional marine education and other science education. And the second, the core of marine education should be bring excitement, mission, and challenges to youth. And the third, mission-oriented, solving problem, learning by doing, will be much more impressed and inspiring than one-way education. And the open and accessible science education is really important for the imbalanced world. And finally, the marine education should be core for innovation and the creativeness to tackle the challenges. In one sentence, 
Let's empower youth by creative science and marine education. That's all. Thank you. Johan, thank you very, very much. I think you've given us a very clear idea of potential approaches to change and enhance education, uh, to make it interesting and exciting and rewarding for young people. And this is so very, very important. So thank you very much for the wonderful examples that you have proposed and the, the efforts that your group is undertaking. Now I would like to pass uh, the uh, microphone on to Andrea Ricci. And I have to admit at about three o'clock this morning, my television set in the hotel in, in Lisbon went on. And amongst all the catastrophes they were talking about, they were talking about the situation for sharks in the world. And I think uh, Andrea will be in a really good position to it go into some detail into this. Thank you, Fred. So my name is Andrea Ritchie, and I am here in Hong Kong. So hello, everybody. 大家好, was Andrea Ritchie, was I Shankar, was Shankar Hu Xiaohui, the executive director. So I'm really excited to be here. And um, I was going to talk about marine education today and the global shark crisis, because that is what we are experiencing now. You know, this picture tells it all. Over a hundred million sharks killed every year. And that is just for shark fins. In fact, a well-known marine biologist told me that the real number is more like 300 million killed because today more and more people are eating shark products. So our mission at Hong Kong Shark Foundation is five words to raise awareness about shark conservation, but also to educate people to say no to shark fin soup and all shark products. This is a great picture right here where I live in a place called Saing Poon in Hong Kong. These are the rooftops of all the buildings around me littered with fresh shark fins. And when you walk along the sharks shops, you can find dried shark fins everywhere. Thousands upon thousands of shops selling hundreds of thousands of shark fins that come in every day. You know, 50% of the global shark fin trade comes right here where I live. So uh, we have a saying, meo mai mai, jo meo sahai. When the buying stops, then the killing stops too. And what I'm gonna show you today is ground zero. You know, 500 species of shark in the world, but sadly in Hong Kong, only 12 are protected by law, only 12. So what are sharks used for around the world? Well, of course, in Hong Kong, we know that shark fin soup is very popular. And in China and in Macau, in Taiwan, in Singapore. But did you know that the fastest growing countries that serve shark fin are in fact not Chinese ethnically run countries. They are countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia, who are following the conspicuous consumption of, of saving face and consuming products that are expensive. You know, five-year-olds that I talk to, because we have an education program that um, we um, run uh, called the Shark Ambassadors, and I ask five-year-olds, why is this man smiling? And they know, they all say money. And that's pretty sad state of affairs in my, my opinion. But the problem is a global shark crisis because now in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, places where they serve fish and chips, in fact, most of the fish and chips today are no longer cod because cod has been overfished to the point where it's so expensive that they now are getting the fish um, that is, in fact, shark. And it, they're using fake names like flake in Australia, lemon fish in New Zealand, um, uh, uh, rock salmon in the UK. In fact, there was a survey that said 10 out of 10 uh, fish and chip shops in London were serving shark. So we as consumers have to be more aware and stop the buying. Another hugely popular product of sharks around the world is shark liver oil, sayu ganyo. 
shark liver oil. And the name is squalene that they sell it up. And it goes in women's lipsticks. Yeah, it goes in lipstick. It goes in moisturizers. And did you know that South Korea and Indonesia are sort of tied for third in the world for consumption of shark products? Not shark fin soup, but shark products. And in fact, Italy, Italy is number two in the world, number one in Europe for consuming shark products. Why? They have a huge leather industry where they use shark skin. They have a makeup industry that's massive and, and they do the leather, but they also eat shark. But the country in the world that eats the most shark, I'll come to in a minute, um, it, it would also has uh, cat food, dog food production, the pet food industry using scraps of uh, shark meat. But I think it's important to understand that the country that actually eats the most shark in the world and the number one is Brazil. 121 people in the world, they eat ceviche, they eat shark as a part of their daily diet. And so we as consumers have to stop consuming and then the killing will stop. This is a great picture put out um, uh, for students to show what poison, lead, mercury, and arsenic, and where that poison comes from. You know, that comes from plastic in the ocean. And so talk a little bit about why sharks are important. You know, they enable biodiversity. They help, sharks help to maintain healthy marine ecosystems. They maintain the food webs. They help manage climate change. They're major carbon sinks. When their bodies die, they grab carbon, sink to the ocean, and they play an important role in regulating prey populations. You know, sustainable development goals are really important. And we have a shark ambassador program where last year in 2021, I taught over 10,000 students in Hong Kong alone, teaching them about sustainability. And what we like to do is teach kids not only about number 14, life below water, but also because sharks are so important, right, as we talked about, but also that life number 15, that sharks are effective carbon sinks to reduce the carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere. And quality education number four is so important to us. And climate action. You know, sharks are super important to helping us combat climate change. So as apex predators, we need sharks. So my talk today I've, is, has been about identifying the problem. It's a global shark problem. But how can you there, wherever you are in the world, Portugal, China, wherever you are, how can you help? You know, Dr. Sylvia Earle, the famous marine biologist, she said, not everybody can do everything, but everyone can do something. So here are some suggestions. You could just take a pledge and say no to shark fin soup and all shark products. Please pass this important message on to your family and friends and be aware. Maybe the fish and chips you're eating or the lipstick you're using can have shark product in it. Take action, create a petition, Sign our petition, which is asking this restaurant, Tao Hung in Hong Kong, which has 88 seafood restaurants serving shark fin, and also over 108 restaurants in Guangdong and Shenzhen, asking them to please stop serving shark fin. You can find this on our website and on our LinkedIn, any of our social media. You know, we get kids together and adults helping us to get active and bring out the message that one third of sharks are now near uh, uh, extinction. You can give back and help by volunteering, by um, you could help us by fundraising, very important for a small charity like ours. You could help us by watching a great movie like Sea Spiracy, because we believe that overfishing is the number one problem in the world right now, and sharks are being destroyed by overfishing. So that is my talk today, and I hope there are some questions. If you're interested in getting more involved or supporting our, our charity, we're looking for donors and supporters, corporate, corporate accounts, corporate clients, and you, anywhere, even if you're in China, we have a Weibo account, Xiangkaohu Xiaohui. So we'd like to invite you to like us on Weibo and to become a volunteer 
and to get active to say no to shark fin soup and all shark products around the world. Just remember, meo mai mai, jo meo sa hai. When the killing stops, right? When the buying stops, then the killing stops too. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to CBC, GDF, and Act Asia for inviting me to speak. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Andrea. That was absolutely, I, I think, I, I don't know whether it was stunning, amazing, horrible, but all of those adjectives apply oh, to yes. the message you brought to us. And, and actionable, actionable, thank you. actionable. Yes. Now Thank I'd you. like to pass uh, the microphone on to Ambassador Patrick Nice, the former ambassador of Belgium to China. My name is Patrick Nice. I used to be a consul general in Shanghai, Hong Kong, Osaka in Japan, and ambassador of Belgium in uh, Beijing. Since 2012, I uh, decided to uh, stay in China and commit myself in uh, environment. Uh, I'm actually developing a permaculture farmhouse deep in the mountain of Yunnan. And um, so I'm very happy to have the occasion to uh, say a few words on uh, um, the occasion of this site event organized by uh, CBC GDF uh, in the side of uh, the Ocean Conference in Lisbon, Lisbon, beautiful city. I'm doing this from Yangzhou, Yangzhou uh, between Shanghai and Nanjing. Nanzhou being a, a very important place for the Great Canal, for the ones who know a bit about the history of China. This is a very important uh, achievement, maybe similar to the Great Wall, but less, less known. So I have participated here to uh, the forum and uh, the General Assembly of the, the World Canal Cities. And th th there has been a lot about uh, sustainability as well. Sustainability is everywhere. I mean, uh, and we are all proceeding from the oceans, and the oceans are maybe the worst case we have in in, in, in the way we have destroyed the environment since since, since the, the beginning of the industrial revolution. Uh, the oceans are actually crying and, 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 and they are becoming a kind of, of dustbin. I mean, don't eat fish. Eat, eating fish is, is actually getting poison and plastic in your body. I mean, so um, we, we need to to go for, for education and then uh, China is doing this, China is moving fast, you know, China has the capacity of, of moving extremely fast and uh, the government is, is aware of, of, of the, the huge challenges ahead. But there is, there is for me a kind of a small brother, I mean, we are, the oceans are the basics of everything and what is happening in the ocean is, is really appalling, appalling. The fishing industry is getting us in, 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 in a situation where, where, where the matrix of, of the world is, has, been, has been deeply, deeply hurt. And, and we need to, to move in regenerating things. We have to regenerate the oceans. We have to bring back the sharks, the whales, the food pyramid. We have to uh, make sure that we are stopping um, piling up these, these, these plastics, you know, and, and the fishing nets are one of the, the, the most, uh, the most, the, the biggest uh, um, accumulation of plastic in the oceans. We, we should, we should not forget that. So, please, let's go for, for education. Let's educate our kids. Actually, they, they are already, I think. Um, aware of, of, of what is going on, they, they are not very happy with the world we are giving to them. And, and but we have to to make sure that uh, more and more people are realizing that it's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to move. It's time for us 
to regenerate the planet that, that we have been uh, um, killing in, in many ways because of our, our, our anthropocentrism, the fact that we, 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 we thought that we were the master of, of everything and we could dispose of, of everything as, as, as according to our, our greediness and our needs. So, um, thank you very much for uh, organizing this site event. I think I'm very happy that China is, is, is there, thanks to, to this uh, NGO, uh, who is doing a, which is doing a very good job. Uh, let, let's let's team up. Let's let's do this together. Let's make sure that uh, we we do all what we can in order to regenerate and restore um, and compensate all the damages that we have been inflicting to our our mother planet. Uh, thank you very much. Well, merci. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And now I promise to be happy to bring back um, Professor James Crab for speaking at the end of the Lovely. Thank you, Fred. Can you hear me? Fred? Great. We have heard some outstanding, inspiring talks this afternoon. But what does inspiring actually mean? The derivation is taking a breath. We breathe in slowly to allow us to do two things. First of all, it allows the oxygen in the air to impress our bodies and act. We need inspiration to act. But there is a second thing that is very important. The oxygen goes to our brain and our brain allows us to think. And that thinking can develop our spiritual awareness. And we have heard some of the wonderful talks this afternoon, which don't just act as evidence, they go straight to our spirit. And it's that combination of spirit and action, which I think we've heard this afternoon. And I'd just like to give you one example which links in, in a way, very much to the sharks. It has to do with consumerism. Depleting terrestrial deposits and rising demand for metals are stimulating interest in the deep sea. And that is an area of the ocean defined as anything below 200 meters, with commercial mining of mineral deposits imminent environmental impact assessments, effective regulation and mitigation strategies are needed to limit the impacts of deep sea mining. Deep ocean sediment ecosystems cover more than half of the Earth's surface and remain one of the least explored ecosystems on the planet. Nutrient recycling for the healthy functioning of ocean ecosystems and carbon sequestration for the regulation of Earth's climate is important for uh, geological timescales. We know from very recent studies that the, the uh, ecosystems appear to be much more diverse than oceanic waters and is composed of communities of mostly unknown eukaryotes. How can we possibly mine something that we don't know? They underline the need for concerted international efforts to further understand this biodiversity and its ecological role in planetary biogeochemical cycles. Saving our ocean must be enhanced as a priority. Marine biodiversity is critical to the health of people and our planet. Large marine protected areas need to be effectively managed, well resourced and, uh, and enforced, and regulations are need to be put in place, as we have heard, to reduce overfishing, marine pollution and ocean acidification. This is the statement that we are putting out as part of this particular um, side event by this NGO, which is so, so important. 
Human-based solutions and community-based conservations like biodiversity conservation in our neighborhoods are necessary for all social sectors. The bringing together of other sustainable development goals, the focus of this, the, this discussion, quality education, affordable clean energy, climate action, life on land will be a mark of collaborative civilization. What is living under the ocean cannot in words tell us what to do. They tell us in actions. We must avoid the mantra of decisions about us without us. And youth must have a place at the table it is their world and all the rest of us can do is pledge our support. It is only by collaboration and cooperation between people and organizations that will achieve our sustainable development goals to maintain our oceans by 2030. And that is the statement that we are putting forward. So finally, I'd like to hand back to my wonderful colleague, Fred to be uh, for uh, how we are going to take this forward in our commitment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, James. That was really inspiring. Uh, I, one of the common threads in all the meetings I've been at in, for the CBD in Geneva, in Nairobi, and today in the uh, UN Ocean Conference is this concept of commitment. And it's so important that we don't think in terms of commitment of nations, commitments of presidents or prime ministers, of, of lawmakers, of ministers. We have to think of our individual commitment. And the first commitment I would hope that we could all make is that let's stay together. Today, CBC GDF has put together a wonderful array of people and I think you found something in common with maybe not all, but at least with some of your colleagues from around the world. Please stay in touch. Make that commitment. CBC GDF will be a wonderful uh, link if you need it. If not, just go ahead and do it. That, that is the first commitment that I think we have to make to stay together, to pool our resources. The second one is mentioned by James, is we must ensure that youth has a place at the table. Now, for many of you, you are youth, and you have a, a responsibility to search out your place and get to the table. The few of us that are a little bit older, we have a responsibility to help you get to the table, but you have to be there. We can no longer expect that the people who caused the problems that we're facing today are the ones that will be able to solve them. And I, this is something I've heard from the top people at the UN, from the presidents of two countries, it's impossible for them to solve the problem. Einstein once said it, it's it's impossible for the people who have caused the problem to become the solution to the problem. And, and I think this is our now, our commitment, our commitment from BGI, our commitment from CBC GDF, and we really like that we make sure that youth has its place at the table and it can act, 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 act. So with that, I have to first of all apologize that we were going to have two discussion periods. However, the interventions were so great, so impelling that it seemed like the wisest idea to, to let everybody have a chance to speak and then let you through the magic of the internet, if we want to call it magic of the internet, to, to dialogue amongst you. If you want to send questions to, to CBC GDF, we would be very, very glad to take them and to either try to answer them or ensure that they go to the people who could provide you with correct answers. The other thing that I would ask CBC GDF is that this not be the last in this series. 
uh, that that we will continue with not in the not too distant future a next process probably before the Montreal uh, uh, COP15 meeting. There will be much and much to discuss before then. So uh, with that, I would like to thank each and every one. Grand merci, Shishini. Uh, obrigado. Uh, all the different languages that are here, even Magoy for the, the, the people <laughs> in, in, in Hong Kong. And I wish you all a great uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, and let's stay together. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.